I think that the Nisa for C are not perhaps so important. But if you have if you have more than 25% of sales abroad, then it's a really important part of your business. So that makes and if it's three, two or five years from inception, it's it's still quite early. And uh, these firms, even if these firms has emerged all over the world during the last decades, they are still quite rare. So in Sweden, it perhaps was a study done last year when they looked at all companies in the manufacturing sector that uh, has uh, been accepted in Sweden for a five years period. And still it were perhaps just three to five percent that went on global. But even if these firms are quite rare, they are important because what this study showed was that these firms had much better growth than other firms. So these small firms that already from inception are international might be the next three to big firms because these firms are better equipped to grow. And I will discuss a little bit about that. So why do we have these boom global firms? I think what we're talking about here is a lot about globalization. What do we mean with that? Well, we have new technology that make it much easier to communicate with other parts of the world. And the big thing here is about uh, making better transports perhaps and now it's much easier and cheaper to have transportation all over the world so in a way the world has become smaller we also have less tra trade restrictions and uh, what also in a way drive globalization is of course that now we have global markets like china that, that's far away from sweden so it's a lot of things that we have this trend of globalization. I think we, we can all agree on that in a way. But even if we have this uh, globalization, why is it so few companies that uh, go abroad? And what I found in my studies and many others is one important thing is, of course, the entrepreneurs behind the companies. Because when I go out and make interviews with these entrepreneurs and war on globals, I ask them, why don't you stay in Sweden? And so what they say, it's a stupid question, why should I stay in Sweden? <laughs> For them that was so natural. So when I started to do research in this area, I, I did my own analysis of the companies, like SWOT analysis and so on, and they look pretty much the same. But then when I went out and made these interviews, one entrepreneur could say, oh, with this all globalization and so, it's, it's so, it's so tough, the competition is so hard. So I have to focus on my home market because it's, it's a lot of foreign um, and uh, I, I, I need to focus on Sweden. But the other one who has a quite similar company, oh, with this so globalization and so, I have the opportunities to go abroad myself. So to understand this, you have to understand how these entrepreneurs uh, think in a way. It's, it's in their mindset. And they could have got these international mindsets, perhaps because they have traveled a lot, they have business experience abroad, they have went in school abroad, and we see a lot of people are more global, and more people get these global ideas. They also have it's, it's very hard for a small firm to have the resources themselves. So to be able to grow abroad, they need to work together with others. And if the, their networks are abroad, yeah, it's natural for them to be boom global. What, what, what I and other has seen when it comes to these studies too, is that there are still a lot of differences between industries. Uh, 
here I have an example from a Hamsta company, RedSense, in the medical technology sector. And in the medical technology sector, you need, before you can sell something, you need to do a lot of trials, product development, cost to all. So in a way, that drives internationalization because you have to invest a lot in product development. And then, of course, you, have, you need to get the money back. But still in this industry, the differences are large between countries. You, the, you have a US, you have your own system, you have to be approved in US and you have to be approved in Europe and in China to be able to sell them. And also we have this different system how to finance healthcare products. In Sweden most go through taxes, other countries perhaps it's more through insurances and also private money. So that's make it different. What we also can see between differences between industries is that that we talked about in the morning. I had a lot of examples from consumer markets, how people were dressed and so on. And that the, what people eat, that is much more different between culture. But if you are producing perhaps technical thing that's in this computer, then it's perhaps not so many cultural differences. So you see a lot of all globals more in business to business companies. I think it's what we have found it's both because of the cultural differences are smaller, but also how you do market things in business to business settings. The value yeah, if they have a product, perhaps you are a supplier to Volvo, you go there and show that product with personal selling. And if they like it, they buy it. If I am Hamst, if I go to Gothenburg or Copenhagen, Hamburg, perhaps doesn't mean so much. But if you are selling consumer products, often you have to reach the end consumer. And then you have to, have to use advertising, build the brand and so is it more resource intensive. So this is to illustrate what I think is important to understand the firm. You need to understand the entrepreneur behind the firm. <coughs> so if IKEA and Inva Kampra Apple and Steve Jobs, even if they, they are not alive, to understand the culture they have built in their companies, I think it's important to understand how they thought when they built their business idea and business models. And often they have, in the beginning, ideas that uh, no one believes in. <laughs> They're before the time, in a way. So often if if, if you find that also in these in global companies, they will often have like a niche product that uh, other companies perhaps are not so interested in. Or not. So then that's why you can have these small companies too, because they are not really threatening the big companies. I will give an example later on on a hamster company here, HMS that is a boom global company. And how, on how, how are they able to create this company? Well, if you are going out to many markets very fast, that's what you can see, characterize boom global. So then you can't do it with uh, your own subsidiaries and so. So you need to, to work with networks and you have agents, distributors, and so on. So what we have seen is that they, yeah, they can go to when the markets because they don't use entremos that are very expensive. What we also have seen in our companies that were studies is that they, they build a structure in culture in the company that hmm, 
make it to make them able to grow in a way. So I I did a study uh, of these international companies where we follow the CEOs for a week <laughs> and then we compared with companies that not were not very international. And then we, then we could see that these CEOs they were working much less with operative things. They worked on strategic things because they had decentralized so that the most of the day-to-day -day business uh, that worked without them. But the, then also when I talked to them, they said that, okay, you follow me a week when I'm at the office now, but most of the time I'm traveling. I'm trying to build up a new subsidiary in the US perhaps. And then the organizations needs to function anyway. So the way they have a decentralized way of controlling the company. And these companies, they was in the business to business sector and they served other business companies and then and they know people who work there. We have quality products, high price. If I do something to please the customer, that's our best marketing. So even if the person there says, okay, we, we need a spare part to shine on um. it, try to fix it even if it costs a lot of things, because the rumor in our industry that we always take care of a customer um. is our best marketing. That, that doesn't go with, for, for every product, but for these products, work very well and then they everyone knows what to do without asking the boss all the time so so I think the idea to go global could be something for many companies but uh, perhaps not for everyone so so why should you go go global early on if you are a small company of course perhaps what most people think of it's it's the sales growth you can sell more, and economies so of size and scale make it, of course, better to sell. So what we also see that they have in their offering value proposition, they have something that are more standardized, so they can have these economies of sales. So perhaps they don't let the customer have ideas about how to change the product, technology and so, but they are often very good at what's around it perhaps, delivery times and how to assemble it and these things they can do. But to, to have also this economies of size that they have this balance between listen to the customer and also this is what we know best ourselves. And what, what, what also has been seen when it comes to these born global firms is that Sometimes I'm talking of liabilities, so newness and smallness. But if you build an international organization already from inception, you build an organization that, that are used to adapt to different contexts, you can learn from different contexts, you know how to work in different competition. You build another organization, then if you build an organization that's very good at one market. So if we talk with some of these business leaders, small Swedish business leaders, they say that, well, that's one of our advantages compared with perhaps US companies. They are super good to deliver to one market, but not always good to adapt to other markets. So, so to be international early on, make you more flexible organization. And of course, it costs more, costs more to go international. So you need to have resources for it. So it's not, not something that's for everyone. So you need to have a business model that can capture enough with money by sales from their own product. And then 
perhaps when we talk of bone globals, it's a lot of new technology, medicine technology and so on. But I've also studied like in the rubber industry, uh, mechanical industry and so on. If you find a niche there, there are not so much competition in a way. <laughs> so then they can have this high price, they can grow more organic. But if, if you are more in a, like medical technology, perhaps nearly everyone needs external finance or venture capital because it takes such time to develop a product before you can sell it. So you have yeah, different business models among those uh, uh, global firms. And you also, of course, need to have people in an organization that fits for this international environment. And here we have this example from Hansa HMS. Have, have ever, anyone heard about that? Yeah? A lot of people, yeah. Uh, it's a Hansa company. It started here from some engineers who went in Hansa University. So they it was Nicholas Haskier and uh, Stefan Dahlström, he's the CEO also today. And what they did from the beginning, they were more like a consulting company. They, they work with how to, the communication between systems from different suppliers. So if you have a robot from Siemens and a computer from IBM or different suppliers, they work with how can they com communicate with each other. So they find these niche that these big companies didn't really want to do. So it was, they could do it, or otherwise they have computer people who work like a separate uh, solution for every company. So in a way, they, they made products that could fit to make this communication uh, possible. And they were early on very international. They were, they were very early in China or Japan. Okay. Uh, I thought I had another picture there. But uh, mm. one of the first customers were Hitachi in Japan. And uh, uh, and that they had the Atlas Copco in Sweden that they wanted to uh, that had one product and Hitachi has the other product and they asked uh, Atlas Copco if they can fix so they can communicate with them, each other and they said okay we can fix this but it takes two years and then Atlas Copco said oh, we have a supplier here in Sweden that can do that in three months so then they got this contact and they also had uh, uh, a Japanese uh, speaking what? No, I work in the history, but they um, Hitachi sent to HMS all instruction that they needed and the okay that they could work with that in Japanese. But no one in HMS uh, know how to speak that. But then for contact in uh, Hamster, it was someone who could help them to translate that. Mike can this better because it's uh, his PhD students so doing a dissertation about HMS dissertation, uh, innovation story. They had a secretary named Monica yeah. at HMS. And that girl, Monica, she was Japanese speaking, a new Japanese country. She oh, was uh, the key. Through Monica, they started to have this dialogue with Japanese company and made success. Ordinary secretary played the key role in this internalization process of HMS. Mm. And in those days, they got the advice that, well, don't go to Japan. It's just too difficult and so, but they didn't really care about that. And when also when I, 
we've talked with HMS today, they don't they don't find the culture differences. Yeah, they are there, but for them it was more the technology new newest that was so so good, so they could overbridge that and of course use perhaps of course uh, contacts. So from HMS and other studies we and my colleagues have done when it comes to go into China. We haven't had so many examples of we haven't found examples when they went to China as the first market. HMS went to Japan first. But now a lot of companies, both small and big, goes into China. And uh, one common way for a small company to enter China is that they follow a larger client, like a lot of larger Swedish or European companies now are present in China, and if they are a supplier to them in Sweden, it's natural to go to follow them. What's also what we have seen that the use Swedish government institutes business Sweden is half government owned, I think, and half private. But as we talked about in this morning, in China, politics and business go hand in hand. So if, if, if you could have a Swedish government institution for helping you with contacts and do things with them, it's, it's also give you a good reputation in China. And also, of course, to bridge this uh, uh, yeah, cultural gap, try to use to recruit local people or to work together with them to find these contacts. But uh, as we talked yesterday, that don't don't hide that you are Swedish, <laughs> because uh, as the pro, lot of Chinese people they found that uh, products from Germany and Sweden and so have a high quality. So I visited getting a company here outside Sweden. They have production in China, but Chinese uh, customers, they want to have swi Swedish produced <laughs> products, even if it's, it's the same quality. So they use the Chinese uh, uh, production to sell, for, uh, to sell to other parts of China. But in China, they are doing sterilizers for hospitals and they are focusing on the really top hospitals in China <laughs> and they want products from Sweden <laughs> but still of course still they had used business Sweden and they have uh, contacts with the Chinese Minister of Health and so to to get in touch and of course China is enormous market. So for a small Swedish company, it's, yeah, you need perhaps you can be present in one part, and that's enough. So you, you can't see China as just one market. And it's very yeah. That I talked before, it might be different, more different to enter with a consumer product, or more cultural sensitive. You have other ways to to reach the customer. How you have advertising and how you, like you might say, how they present things in shops and so. so it's, I think it's tougher for a small consumer market for us than for a business to business for us to go early on to China. And of course, it's <coughs> the change rate in China is so high. Everything goes so fast, so you have to be aware of that. So sometimes we say that uh, you need to do a lot of market research and so but if the market is if it's too much change, perhaps it's better to try and see if it works because if you do some type of market research it's totally different a year from now. So how can you 
prepare people to be more international and to work in these small uh, high growing firms. So we have an example here in Hamsta. I have good students here who went. We have this we have a master's program in strategic entrepreneurship in, for international growth. And we also have this in innovation management. And I think that's of course if you believe in international uh, trade, international firms, what could you do as a state to support that? I think we, sh we should support that and we have young people in universities and schools that we, in a way, let them take part in international exchange and so, so, so from the individual level it will then turn up, I think, entrepreneurial opportunities that we, well, that we can't control in a way, but it comes from below and that, I think it's good for society that we have this connection between people from different countries and uh, we have the, uh, we talk with the students in our program what, what they're what they really appreciated with our program and what they said was that the course is that they worked in international teams it's students from all over the world so it's it's not just what you learn from the textbooks and from the teacher but perhaps it's even more important that you learn how to work together with people from different culture and uh, and also that that Mike have initiated is this optional thing that we have for students that uh, to go to China and I think that is something that make our program a bit unique and hopefully and I, and I know that the students have appreciated that a lot so so that's what, what I have to say about global and similar things Questions? Yeah. Questions, please. I would like to make a comment on second from the last piece. Okay? Second from the last. Second from the end. That one. Yeah. Uh, number three. Yeah. yeah. So it's local first stop. Yeah. That is something I, that I see quite often in China nowadays. Western companies, Swedish companies, they think Swedish managers are too expensive. So they take them home. They say, we have a lot of uh, Chinese students been studying in Sweden, they understand Swedish culture, they even speak Swedish fluently, they are very good in English, they are very high skilled. We take them as managers of Swedish companies. And they do that. What is happening? Only after two or three years you see that they are going down. The companies are going down. Why? They don't understand the Chinese way of thinking. Chinese people don't trust Chinese. Chinese people don't trust Chinese products. Chinese people don't trust Chinese suppliers. They think it's fake. They don't have trust in them. In general, Chinese trust Western people more. They trust Western technology more, particularly the German one. They love German technology. Chain exchanges, Swedish managers with Chinese, make Chinese lose trust in the Swedish company. They sh save money, I know, but they lose uh, the, the, the value of the brand and they lose market in China. It's a short-sighted solution and short-sighted outcome. Don't do that. And one company that goes the other way around is IKEA. They are more now booming from 35 to 95 stores in China. They take Swedish staff with them to China in every shop they have. Because that is a branding of Swedish furniture, Swedish products, by Swedish people. And it works. And now Volvo <coughs> is not perceived anymore as Swedish car. It's produced in China. So now it's second-hand car. It doesn't have the same value as before. This is a way of Chinese way of thinking that we need to understand. And then you don't exchange Swedish managers that way to save money in the short run. Doesn't work that way. That's my experience. Yeah, I think perhaps a good thing could be then to have 
if, if you have in the direct contact with customers so that they have local people but also don't uh, take well all the swears, you have to have a way to reach this and I think it's you go just with Swedish people in China when you're growing it might be difficult yeah so yeah there's a lot one can uh, say but when you have this question of the difference in cultures yeah cultural matrix one thing that <clears throat> I think is very clearly uh, a cultural a stumbling block in yeah. Sweden yeah. is that uh, because of historical and political and economic uh, uh, policy making uh, Swedish uh, thinking is outside of Swedish language is always in English yeah. now that functions to a certain degree internationally but there, as far as I know right now instead of creating a context for exactly the type of thing that you know, Mike has raised or others, that is an ability for the population from the time they are young yeah. to begin to learn Chinese yeah. in Sweden. Yeah. That is to integrate the Asian cultural uh, matrix in the form of at least beginning to understand the Chinese language. Yeah. If you don't do that, yeah. There will be exceptions of people who will go there and learn, yeah. but you will not create the uh, fluidity whereby it will become a more easier thing that was raised earlier. That, well, you go first to the other Scandinavian countries because they're also English is their second language, yeah. or the U.S., yeah. or England. Yeah. So I think that's that's an issue, and yeah, there is a problem so. there when yeah. they start to start closing down uh, Confucius Institutes in Sweden instead yeah. of opposite, opening yeah. up the possibility for cultural exchange. Yeah. That's just yeah. a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, yeah, I think it's and it's much more. I think it's to do business is much more than the language. Like we have a lot of Swedish farmers who the US they think they can do business now there because they know the language, but uh, they learn that it's not so easy. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, it's uh, more complicated. It's more complicated, and of course, it's even more complicated when Swedish farmers go to China because it's even more yeah, it's more different. But sometimes it's the yeah, Swedish company in a way acknowledge that. Okay, China. We don't here. I ha need to take some help from someone else, and, and perhaps work with someone in China or business Sweden while while they go to more. Yeah, even to Norway, it could be that it's different. But they uh, they think everything is the same in Norway. But it could be different ways how how yeah, about culture and things. Even it is more. So some sometimes you make these business mistakes in culture that are closer to your own because they think uh, then it's completely the same. <laughs> we have one more question over there. I have to go on, otherwise we are out of time. One short. All right. Uh, uh, let me ask, have you in your research and studies uh, looked into the impact or the, the rate of success uh, if you have some Chinese with you who are Chinese inside China? Who are in or just going in without any with their own Western company going into China. I, I think these are what I found from my case studies that they said that they had done that they I think it's it's few that have succeed with completely going in their own. Then they have, then in a way they have withdrawn and then they have tried a different way to get contacts through business Sweden or higher local or work more closely. So it's I think in, in other more close countries they can go in and just let it organically grow a little bit. But it seems like if you if you want to go into China from the experience of the company outside then you have to really really invest in it. And perhaps learn from some mistakes and then continue to invest because it's such a big mark. So it's not 
it's, it's not something, as I was saying, that just happens. <laughs> then you need to, but then you, when you made this investment, you will get the money back because it's such a large market. But it's what I've seen from my case study is that it's when they haven't really invested, then they it didn't work, and they didn't really understand why. That's okay. Okay. Thank you very much.